Thank you for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Don Hagen, and I'm an assistant professor and forest ecologist in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation at Clemson. Uh, it's great to see you guys here. It's great to see some former students here. Um, some of this stuff might sound kind of familiar with some students that have maybe had my forest ecology class in the past. Um, but I'm going, to I'm going to be talking today about fire. It's kind of a, a cross-cutting theme with a lot of these different talks. Using fire as a restoration tool. And I think I'm going to touch on little things uh, that Victor talked about, uh, that Joe talked about, and, and also uh, that Drew just talked about. So hopefully it'll dovetail nicely. So using fire as a restoration tool, highlight, highlights from ongoing research in the Southern Appalachians. My wife made me put this slide in because she's a restoration ecologist, right? She said, you've got to define what it is. And so she directed me to the Society for Ecological Restoration website, and here's the, here's the definition. Ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. We've talked about the different ways uh, that, uh, that our forests have been impacted by past mismanagement in some cases, and they're in need of restoration. Right? Ecological restoration is, fo is focused on something that, we're, uh, that I think that by, by virtue of the fact that we're here, it's something that we all care about. It's healthy, diverse, and resilient ecosystems. And it takes a landscape scale approach, right? How can we maximize these values, forest health, forest diversity, and resiliency across a whole landscape while also thinking about those high value sites already in that landscape, those patches of old growth, for example. How can we protect those? connect those and better integrate those into the broader landscape, right? That's ecological restoration. So then the next question is, and it's kind of a rhetorical question at this point, have Southern Appalachian ecosystems been damaged, degraded, or, or destroyed? And the answer is yes, they have. Uh, there's several factors at play here. Uh, if you were to go back 100 or more years, you know, one of the big impacts that we saw in these forests is, was high grading. Are you all familiar with high grading? You know, y'all know what that is. Okay. When 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 logging was basically unregulated, and it was a take take the best and leave the rest kind of situation, right? Um, so that so that happens. This could be a, a situation you know created by high grading right here, right? That old that old chestnut oak right there, twisted curved log right there. You know, that, that that tree could be 150 years old. 100 you know 100 years ago when there was logging going on. Somebody saw this twisted curved tree and said, that'll never make a log. I'm going to cut everything else and leave that. Right? That's high grading. They might have, if that was in a chestnut oak, shortleaf pine community, they might have cut the shortleaf pines out and left the scraggly chestnut oaks. That's high grading. Right? Non-native invasive species. Right? That's a growing concern, whether you're talking about plants, whether you're talking about animals. It's the kind of thing that a hands-off approach is not going to be the solution. Right? We have to get out in front of that with active management. These Loblolly and Eastern White Pine plantations, right? They're relics of a, of a previous era in Forest Service management when they had a different goals, right? We need to remove those or, or, or manage those, at least in some cases, if we, if we hope to restore them back to something more appropriate for that site. And then finally, elimination of the historic disturbance regime. And in this case, I'm mostly going to be talking about fire. Right, the elimination of fire from this landscape has had huge implications for what our forests look like, for their successional trajectories. It's had implications for birds. It's had implications for native wildflowers, all sorts of things. And we know this story, right? The Smoky Bear campaign. Smoky Bear was extremely successful at convincing people that fire was wrong in the mid-1930s. Right? Fire was effectively eliminated from the landscape. Right? Not just here, but pretty much everywhere else. And that was based on a misconception that fire was strictly a destructive force. Right? There are places in the world, there are places in the country, there are places on this landscape where fire can be a destructive force, where fire is not appropriate. But the blanket condemnation of fire across this landscape was counterproductive. Right? And we're working to reverse that by reintroducing fire. The elimination of fire has resulted in some tremendous changes to our landscape. So this is, uh, and I, I just realized now that I forgot to properly attribute this, this is from a recent paper in Forest Ecology and Management. I didn't do it. Um, uh, some other authors did. But this, is, this is the change in oaks and maples over the last 30 years across the whole eastern United States. 
right? But you can see the Southern Appalachians there, right? Just the Appalachians in general, where they fit on this. And so this is based on forest inventory and analysis data. So each one, there's just tens of thousands of tiny little pixels. Each of those represents a long-term vegetation plot. Over the last 30 years, anywhere where you see a warm color, a red, a yellow, or an orange, we've seen a decline. Anywhere where you see a cool color, greens, for example, we're seeing an increase. And what you can see, particularly in the Southern Appalachians, is declines in oaks right? and increases in maples. Right? If, I had a, if I had a figure for yellow poplar, it would look pretty similar to that maple figure. If I had a figure for black gum, it would look pretty similar to that maple figure. Right? So oaks are largely declining. We see reds throughout much of the Southern Appalachians. Fire is a big reason why, or the elimination of fire right? from the landscape. We see it with shortleaf pine, and I apologize that, 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 that some of the, uh, the text is sort of small. But re across the entire range of shortleaf pine, which is many states across the eastern United States, there's been a 53% reduction in shortleaf pine acreage since 1980, so in 40 years, based off of the same forest inventory and analysis plots. 53%, right? We see it in almost every state where shortleaf pine occurs. This blue, this blue bar represents the, the, the data from 1980. This next bar represents 2010. The next one represents 2012. And this is the change that occurred during that time. We're losing shortleaf pine. Fire's not the only reason, but it's, a, it, it's part of that reason. We're losing shortleaf pine from this landscape. That's what shortleaf pine can look like. And you saw some pictures um, that, that, uh, that previous presenters showed now this, I'm not here to suggest that shortleaf pine communities across the Andrew Pickens all look like this, right? But, but scattered trees, sort of a woodland condition with a lush, grassy, herbaceous understory certainly would have been within that range of variability of the shortleaf pine systems that you would have seen, right? Sometimes it might have oaks mixed in, sometimes it might have been dominated by oaks with just a, with, with a few shortleaf pines. It depends on the community, it depends on the fire history, right? But you'd be hard pressed to find anything like that around here. That looks almost like longleaf pine down in the coastal plain. All right? We've lost communities like that. That picture is Arkansas. Is that where that's from? I think so. Yeah. But certainly it could have it could have occurred here. All right? We've lost. Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back for a second. So all of these, you know, we've lost oaks. Right? Oaks are on the decline. Shortleaf pine is on the decline. Along with that, what we've seen is this. Our forests, our forests have become more dense through a process called mesification. They've become more dense, more shady, more moist, and they've also become very homogenized, much more so than they probably would have been historically. Right? So if you look at these ecological zone maps that Joe talked about across the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, there's like 13 or 14 pretty distinct communities. Right? There's some stands. There's some stands in Jocassi. We're in a 16-acre stand. In theory, there could be seven different forest types, right? But then you go there, and it's really basically just one forest type, right? It's been homogenized, right? And along with that, we've seen, we've seen a loss of some key species. Purple, clone, purple coneflower, federally endangered species there on the left. Georgia aster there on the right. My daughter's named after that species. Uh, that's not federally listed, but it is a candidate uh, for listing. Both of them are extremely rare. We don't have a lot of old growth forest in the AP. We have maybe even less of this, right? Uh, these, these really, really rare species. They're hard to find. But historically, they would have been a component of that kind of understory. The woodlands, the savannas, the grasslands that, were, that existed across that spectrum of communities that you'd see across the landscape. Right? Talk about birds. I'm not a bird expert, um, but we've seen declines in several key species, just as, just as Drew just talked about, right? So, I put rare in parentheses because these species aren't, to my knowledge, federally listed, but you don't find them in a landscape that's dominated mostly by middle-aged and old forests, right? They need more open habitats. Uh, prairie warblers, right? They're not gonna be in a dense, closed canopy forest. Eastern meadowlarks, there's probably some out there, but there's probably not very many of them in those dense, closed canopy woods. Northern bobwhites, right? I've seen too many of those these days. Concurrent with these changes in forest structure, 
these declines in certain species, um, both plants and animals. We're also seeing some pretty dramatic increases in fuel accumulation. Right? When I talk about fuel accumulation, I'm, talk about, I'm talking about the stuff that could potentially burn in a fire. You've got two main types of fuels. You've got live fuels and dead fuels. One of the, mo one of the live fuels that we're most concerned with is going to be mountain laurel. Right? Back when fire was more frequent, you would see a lot of your ericaceous shrubs like mountain laurel, probably lower in lower landscape positions. Right? You take fire out of the equation, and what does mountain laurel do? It walks up to the top of the mountain. Right? There's nothing really to stop it. There's nothing to keep it in check. It's problematic because it can act like a ladder fuel. Low intensity fire on the forest floor can then become a crown fire, and that's not what we want. Right? Dead fuels as well are big problems. Um, we've seen, and I'll, 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 tell you, I'll show you some data or tell you some data here in a minute, some really eye-popping data, eye-popping numbers for fuel accumulation in some of these sites, particularly these eastern white pine plantations. The fuel accumulation is off the charts. Tremendous wildfire risk if it's dry enough for it to ignite. All right? And that's what we don't want. All right? There's a difference between prescribed fire and wildfire. All right? We want to burn on our own terms to meet our restoration objectives, not wait till a cigarette or a lighting bolt or something else does it, right? because we live here now. We've got homes and roads and hospitals. right? We don't want to see this, this happen. That's Table Rock in 2016. Right? We can prevent that. We can reduce the likelihood of that by using prescribed fire. There's a lot of evidence of past fire across this landscape. And, and, and uh, you know, you don't have to look too hard to see it, um, particularly on some of the ridge tops where fire would likely have been most common. Table Mountain Pine, for example, shortleaf pine, you'll often see fire scars. Right? This is an example of a tree that was killed by fire eventually, but it survived several fires. Right? And you can see the scars here in the, in the wood. That tells us that fire was common, and it also gives us an idea about how often those fires occurred. In this case, I think it was every five to eight years. If you dig holes in the Andrew Pickens Ranger District, and I've dug a few of them, you'll oftentimes see carbon, charcoal in the soil. Right? And that's really interesting as well, because while fire, while fire scars can give us an idea of you know, fire frequency, how often fires occurred, they only go so far back in time. Right? A couple hundred years at most. We can carbon date this charcoal right here, though, and get an idea of how long we've had fire on this landscape. And it could very well be, yeah, it's 10,000 or, 10, or more years. So fire's been here for a long time across much of this landscape. There's also some historical accounts. Traditional ecological knowledge. I just came across this paper, and I, and I apologize if you can't read it. Uh, it says, Understanding Traditional Knowledge for Ecological Restoration, a Quantitative Study of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Right? Fire was sacred to the Cherokees. Right? And there were some researchers a few years ago uh, working with Dr. Uh, Catherine Elliott, who, who I believe is at Coweta, um, who interviewed Cherokees, living Cherokees, and asked them, you know, tell us about the traditions that were passed down in your family about fire. Right? What have you heard about fire? Here's some quotes. Across the whole mountainside, they would annually burn the whole forest floor. In those days, they said the mountains were like a park. There was grass and even in between the trees, and not that much brush. Right? You'd be hard pressed to find a lot of sites that look like that now. Right? That description right there, open park-like forest, it wouldn't have been across the whole landscape, only on certain places, maybe ridge top, southwest facing slopes. That's got fire written all over it. Right? William Bartram. This is really interesting. You know, I, I teach uh, William Bartram, uh, is, for one of my classes, William Bartram's Travels is one of my required readings. And it's really interesting if you read William Bartram's travels. He left the, town, the Cherokee town of Seneca, which is approximately where present day Death Valley, the stadium in Clemson is, about where the rowing center, if you know where that is. Headed up the Kiwi River, up to about uh, Salem, and then over the, uh, up the Blue Ridge Escarpment, ended up around Franklin, well, present day Franklin. And it's really interesting because if you, if you pay attention to the part where he's actually going through what's now the Andrew Pickens Ranger District, the plant communities he described don't really sound like fire adapted plant communities. He's talking about these vast calicanthian groves. That's sweet shrub. Remember that one, Jesse? Sweet shrub? Sweet shrub, right? He's talking about uh, uh, Fraser magnolia. He's talking about little buckeyes and stuff, right? That doesn't sound like fire dependent vegetation because it wasn't, right? If you, if you look at where he was actually traveling, he was going up the Kiwi River Valley. 
in a valley where you wouldn't, ex in, a, in a place, a landscape position where you wouldn't expect fire to happen. Now, when, it, when he went up over the Blue Ridge Escarpment, though, ended up in what's now Franklin, he talked about how the Cherokees, oftentimes, would band together and take care of one another if fire burned down their house or if it burned down their crops. And then, I, and, and this quote is from that portion when he's over around Franklin. My first ascent and progress down the west side of the mountain was remarkably gradual, easy, and pleasant through grassy open forests. That doesn't happen without fire, right? That says something about the Cherokee use of fire. The reality is most of the fires across this landscape were probably lit by humans, right? Lightning ignitions are possible, but the large fires, the frequent fires, were probably lit by humans. Humans have been here for a really long time millennia. But I'm not a historian, I'm a forest ecologist. I'm interested in plants. And I think some of the most compelling evidence that fire is important across this landscape and has been important for a long time is the vegetation itself. There's Table Mountain Pine, a central and southern Appalachian endemic. You don't find it anywhere else except for ridge tops, upper slopes, and the central and southern Appalachians. Wood well, has an adaptation, serotonous cones, cones that require heat to open up. That very strongly indicates that fire has been here a long time, long enough for that, ad that adaptation to evolve. Table Mountain Pine. There's some other adaptations. Um, Shortleaf Pine doesn't have serotonous cones, but it's one of the handful of pines that can resprout. That's a fire adaptation. Pitch Pine will do the same thing. Chestnut Oak that you see up on these ridges. There's a reason why Chestnut Oak has super thick bark, and its closest relative, Swamp Chestnut Oak, has super thin bark. That reason is probably because fire happens on ridges where you find chestnut oak and not in swamps where you find swamp chestnut oak. Right? And then, of course, Georgia aster, which maybe doesn't directly depend on fire, but it depends on those habitats created by fire, those open, early successional habitats. We could go on and on about fire history, but I'm sure Helen brought some of these. Uh, this is the fire history of the Southern Appalachians. It looks like there's some of them stacked right here. So if, this, if, if you find this stuff interesting, I encourage you uh, to take a look at that. Right? But I want to get more into my research now. So I've got a handful of research projects going on in the AP and the surrounding areas. Um, and I'm not going to bog, bog you down with results. I'm going to focus mainly on pictures and just a few key findings. Uh, one of the projects that I have going on in the Andrew Pickens District is a fire seasonality project. In 2015, the Consortium of Appalachian Fire Managers and Scientists identified fire seasonality as the number one research priority. Most of our burning in this area happens, our prescribed burning has historically happened in that sort of January to March dormant season time frame. Those burns work pretty well for uh, reducing fuels, and they work okay for changing forest composition. But what happens if you burn in May, right? What happens if you burn in late April, in that early part of the growing season? Can you meet those fuel reduction objectives while maybe enhancing your ability to meet your restoration objectives? So since 2016 or so, I've been working on this project. With a, it's funded a couple grad students. That's my, uh, one of my grad students, Matt Vaughn, there in the middle. You might have run into him out in his Dodge Ram pickup truck. Emily Oakman, you might know her. She's South Carolina Forestry Association. Patrick Chris there on the right. Uh, he worked for uh, Paper Rock State Park for a while. I don't know if you knew him. Just here's some, here's some basic findings from that. Well, let me. The colors are kind of washed out, but basically what I have here is I have clusters of burn units, right? I've got four clusters of burn units. I've got a dormant season burn unit, a growing season burn unit, and then a control that wasn't burned. I've got four of those. Two over here in the Andrew Pickens district, one in the upper uh, part and one in the lower part. And then I've got uh, two more of those clusters across the river in the Chattahoochee. And uh, we've had seven fires since starting, since starting this project totaling about 6,000 acres. Four of them were growing season burns, three of them were dormant season, no, four were dormant, three were growing season burns. And here's what we're finding. Fire behavior is tremendously variable, right? This is the Russell Mountain Fire. This is a dormant season burn, late January uh, 2018. I don't know how well you can tell from that picture, but only about half of that landscape actually burned, right? You got some spots where it got pretty hot right here, and you got spots that didn't burn at all, right? A lot of variability in, in, in fire behavior, and as a restoration ecologist, someone who looks to enhance the diversity across this landscape, I see that as a good thing. I don't know how Wes sees it. He might have wanted to burn the whole mountain. But, uh, but uh, you know, we're enhancing, right? We, we've taken a forest that was relatively homogeneous, and now we've added some additional variability by putting fire back on it. 
fire behavior is especially variable in the growing season. We see a large increase in herbaceous cover in both the dormant season and the growing season. Right? There's very little herbaceous cover in a lot of these sites. Pre-fire, you see a large increase in a lot of them post-fire. We see extreme fuel loading and extremely low species richness. The highest levels of fuel loading and the lowest levels of species richness, just numbers of species, in those stands that have eastern white pine. Those closed canopy eastern white pine stands are just a tinderbox of fuel and they're a biological desert. There's almost nothing else there except for eastern white pine, at least in the ones where my plots happen to land. All right. We also learned that off-site eastern white pine can be killed with a growing season fire. Hadn't killed any in the dormant season yet, but we can kill them in the growing season. All right. Those are eastern white pine plantations. Both of these are in the Andrew Pickens district. We've got two plots that fell on them. 43 tons of fuel per acre in these stands. That's about two and a half times the average that we're seeing across the Andrew Pickens. 43 tons. That's a, t that's a lot of fuel, right? That's a whole lot of fuel, a lot of heavy down, coarse woody stuff, a bunch of litter on the forest floor and a thick layer of duff below that, just a lot of stuff that can burn if it gets dry. And it's hard to really tell, but there's almost no vegetation, just some scattered sprigs of things on the forest floor. About 2.5, about two and a half species per square meter on average on the forest floor, compared to a six to seven on average in sites that don't have eastern white pine. We've got to restore that, right? We gotta, we've got to actively manage that to take care of that fuel and restore some of that diversity. Right. This is what we're seeing. This is a site actually in, uh, uh, over in Chattahoochee National Forest, part of the same project. Growing season burn. Look at the herbaceous response. Right. We've got little wildflowers in here that you can see. Uh, there's some little asters and, and things like that. And Coreopsis. Uh, a fair bit of regeneration. We do have some maples and poplars coming in, uh, but there's also a lot of oak regeneration in there as well, where there was previously very little. Right. One burn did that. Right. There's some chinkapin flowered and fruited in the second year or the second growing season after, or after a dormant season burn. That's on Big Ridge in, in Wool Woman Wildlife Management Area. Across the river, what do we have here? Oh, this is uh, another site. Uh, that is an eastern white pine right there, right? Off site, it's just up the hill from a site where it's planted. This is another reason why we need to get rid of some of these plantations, manage them, is because the trees don't necessarily stay there. They can seed into your surrounding landscape. That's what happened here, right? Plantation is off here somewhere. It's seeded into this landscape, but we killed it with a growing season fire. That's a pretty good sized tree. We killed it with a growing season fire. We also uh, knocked back a lot of the mountain laurel that was below it, right? That's a short leaf pine oak site, right? Eastern white pine has no business there. But we've got to get it out of there in order to read to be sure we pine it out. All right, so there's some long-term fire effects monitoring that's also going on. Uh, this, is, this project is a collaboration between uh, myself at Clemson University, Dr. Angela Meck, uh, who's a uh, postdoctoral researcher at Clemson, uh, Pete Bates at Western Carolina, Adam Coates at Virginia Tech, also uh, CAFMS and the Fire Learning Network. Since, I believe, 2006, uh, there's been data collected from a series of long-term uh, monitoring plots, really all across the whole southern Blue Ridge. We do have some, one set of plots in Jocassi and one set up there on Russell Mountain. And what we're doing here, and Angela is analyzing these data right now, we're going to have some really great results to report in the spring. What we're doing is we're looking at just, it's not a research project per se, just looking at how these forests change, right? And what we're seeing it's kind of what you would expect, reductions in fuels, right? Fire is your most cost, uh, prescribed fire is your most cost effective way to reduce fuels, right? And we are across the board reducing fuels when we burn. We're reducing canopy density, particularly in some of these drier sites, mainly due to the mortality of small trees. Prescribed fires, for the most part, with the exception of that eastern white pine that I showed you on a previous slide, they're typically not killing stuff greater than six inches in diameter, right? So those small trees, some reductions in canopy density uh, due to their mortality. We are seeing reductions in mountain laurel cover and also height. I don't know if you can ever really get rid of mountain laurel, but you can make it smaller, where it acts less like a ladder fuel. And the effects are cumulative. An individual burn, in most cases, doesn't, I mean, doesn't bring about dramatic change. Right? Brings about incremental change. We've got some sites that have just had their third burn, though. Right? So these results build on each other. Right? And that six inch diameter tree that wasn't killed by the first fire 
was damaged and stressed, maybe it will be killed by that third fire. All right. the, idea here, the idea here being that you know, we realistically probably can't expect to reverse 80 years of fire exclusion with one burn. Right? This is a long-term process. This is a career. Right? You could work your whole career in this and see some pretty modest changes. Right? But that's what foresters do. We have that long-term long vision. So, but in some cases, it might be appropriate to combine fire with other treatments right, to expedite the restoration project process. For example, the longest running fire and fire effects study in the eastern United States is in Green River Gamelands in western North Carolina. I'm part of this project. I've been working on it for a few years. And in this site, since 2001, we've had four treatments. We've had uh, some, some units that have been burned four times, typically every three or so years. We've had units that have experienced two mechanical treatments, which is just chainsaw felling of small trees. We've had units that experienced a combination of those two, and then we had controls. So these are replicated across the landscape. Emily Oakman worked on this for her master's project. And we've got all kinds of results. I can send you this paper if you're really interested. But repeated fire, especially when combined with a mechanical treatment, dramatically in increases oak regeneration. Oaks are declining. Right? But if you take multiple fires, combine them with multiple mechanical treatments, and I'm not talking about big pieces of equipment tearing up the woods. I'm talking about a guy with a chainsaw going out and cutting small trees. That's enough to stimulate oak regeneration. Right? You can see this here, 2001 and 2006. This line right here is that mechanical plus burn treatment. Just skyrocketing. And now we're starting to see some of those trees that established in 2001, 2002, are actually making it into the canopy. So we're shifting, we're reversing that trend of oak decline uh, in Green River. If you look at grass and herb cover, you see pretty much the same trend, right? The burn treatment, you see some of an increase. If you combine it with a mechanical treatment, even bigger increase. Another paper from the same study. Well, one of the cool things about the studies, we've been able to nest other studies within it. We looked at uh, herps, reptiles and amphibians. Right? You, you know, this is the salamander capital of the world. You think that salamanders would be pretty sensitive to fire and active forestry operations. And it turns out that they're not. We didn't see any effect on salamander populations, even in that mechanical plus burn treatment. Right? We, also, we actually saw increases in lizards and skinks. Right? And no species, were, no species were, were impacted negatively. Or no groups of species, I should say. Birds. Drew was a part of this study. That mechanical plus burn treatment actually saw an increase in bird diversity, mainly driven by increases in cavity dwellers and shrub and ground nesting birds. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're expediting that restoration project, combining these treatments, and then these, these wildlife species are benefiting from that. Woodland savanna restoration, just a quick mention of this. I've uh, got a couple uh, undergraduate students. They're working right across the street, Damascus Church Road, right down there. Uh, uh, Victor mentioned this. Um, there's going to be a fire in the coming days. These sites were thinned. They chopped it. They basically <coughs> mulched up uh, the materials, the, the fuels after they thinned it. We're about to burn it. And we're going to study fire behavior and vegetative response in these masticated fuel beds. And it's interesting, even though we haven't burned it yet, the first time we went out there, I kicked up two bob white quail. Two bob white quail, I, I, I almost pee my pants. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, I mean, right there at my feet, uh, we saw one Georgia aster. Just one, but it was there, right? So even without fire, we're creating that habitat, right? But fire is going to help sustain that habitat. Right? That's what it looks like right now. Right? So a nice woodland, scattered trees. Wild turkeys love this place, right? So we've got uh, closed canopy forest over here. That woodland habitat's here on the right. There's a whole group of turkeys right there crossing the road. They were feeding on one side, roosting on the other. Right? That they're already benefiting from that habitat heterogeneity that's been created by these forestry practices. Right? Fruits everywhere. You, you mentioned that you can tell where somebody's been by looking at their shoes. My shoes were purple. Every time we go out there working in this field, there were so many blueberries and blackberries. Uh, Crystal, one of those two students, made some of the, the best blueberry muffins I've ever had with wild blueberries. They're everywhere. All right. Also doing some ecological departure analysis, building off of what some of Joe talked about, uh, doing some work in Jocassi. I know I'm running out of time. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about this more, I can. But basically, we're using these ecological zone maps that, and, and, the, and this, uh, the, these, uh, these programs that Joe has developed. 
to, we'll go places on the landscape, we'll look at the map and see what it's supposed to be, and then we'll go to ground truth and see what it is. Right? Okay, we know it's supposed to be some fire dependent habitat. Right? We go there, okay, what is it? How different, how departed is it from what it should be? And we can use that knowledge to develop management prescriptions. If it's only slightly departed, maybe it just needs fire. Right? If it's extremely departed, we might, need, we might need fire perhaps in combination with some other treatments to get it more where it needs to be. But in summary, you know, fire historically played an important role in shaping southern Appalachian forests. The exclusion of fire has contributed, it hasn't been the only factor, but it's contributed to the degradation of much of the southern App Appalachian landscape. Prescribed fire alone or in combination with other treatments is helping to restore our forests. And an integrated approach linking management with science from the region. Right? I'm not the only one doing fire ecology research in the southern Appalachians. There's actually a long history of really high quality research from the AP. Some of the first fire research in the Southern Appalachians period was done here by guys like Dave Van Leer and Tom Waldrum. So there's a tremendous body of knowledge that these managers can draw upon, right? And that's what these forests need. And with that, I don't know if I have time for questions. I guess we're good. <laughs>